Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third annual Bernstein Book Arts Lecture. My name is Lynn Karanek, and I welcome you to this wonderful event. Um, today, we are very thrilled to have distinguished book artist Diane Fine uh, as our speaker. And Diane is a UW alumna, so this is a great opportunity for her to um, reconnect with her colleagues and friends and to meet some new students here while she's here. Thank you, Lynn. Um, lights go low, right? There, heard the beep. Um, thank you, Lynn, for that introduction and the honor of this invitation to speak and exhibit my work in this place that is part of my history and my heart. Thank you to my hosts, Tracy and Mark, um, for all, for, and all of you for coming today to allow me to share my work with you. Your introduction was beautiful, and I already found myself having even more questions about your mother, Mark, so we can talk about that later. I got choked up just um, thinking about it. Thank you for that introduction, and thank you again, uh, Tracy and Mark. Um, OK, to start it, I undo mute, mute got it. It's up there. Oops. So my press is called the Mooncash Press, um, and I did take that press name when I was here as a, a graduate student, and I started publishing, and everyone said that's one of the first things you need to do. And um, what I did was I wanted to honor my grandfather, who, and you can see here, he was from Hungary, he was born in Hungary, and I, it's, it's mapped out there for you to see, um, there are many different ways to say Munkash. I did it phonetically, right? American granddaughter language. That's what I always heard when he talked to us. Just so you have a sense of where it is, Munkash is now part of the Ukraine. The arrows are pointing there. When my grandfather was born there, it was hungry. And reading about it over, over time, it's bounced back and forth quite a bit. Um, it had a thriving Jewish community um, at one point, I read that it was at least 50% Jewish. Um, at the end of World War II, there were maybe 100 Jews still in Munkash. Happily, um, my grandfather came to this country, welcomed through Ellis Island um, as a child in the early part of the 19th century. I'm at the 20th century. Um, and here he is, Joseph Klein, and he's with his, um, his wife, Dottie. And um, he was ashamed. I mean, he was this really very, very intelligent, funny, everyone loved him, especially women loved him, and he loved women, charming guy. And he only got to go to school through fifth or sixth grade before he had to leave and work. And um, he was from a large family. And um, it was something he felt bad about. And the reason I decided to name my press after him was that he was so strong in the oral tradition. He was a storyteller. And when he would come, I'm the youngest of three girls, he would come and we would just, not just us, kids in the neighborhood would be like, oh, is your grand, you know, Papa Joe coming? Can we come? And he would tell us stories. And those stories often began with, well, back in Mooncash, I mean, in Mooncash, you know, so it's how I thought about it. And he told the stories over and over again. And we would say, tell the one where, right? So that whole idea of repeating stories. And a couple of stories, one I'll share with you, he said to us, one or two, he would say to us, you know, I was the smartest boy in all of Mooncash. What, you were? the smartest boy, they, you know, and he would go on and on, on our street, not just in our street, in the whole neighborhood, in the whole city. You were, you were, and he was, when I was just five years old, I touched a hot iron and nobody had to tell me to take my hand away. <laughs> Another, and then the next time he came, he would tell us that story again, and we were like, you were, you were. He told a story about getting in a scrape at school as a kid, in elementary school, and coming home, and he was beaten up or whatever. 
And his dad's like, I have to teach you how to fight, you know, that whole story. They went out in the alleyway. And he would do the, he would say, and my dad taught me, go like this, go like this, this, you know. So he had this whole lesson. He goes back to school. And a couple of days later, he comes home, and he's beaten up again. His dad's like, what happened? You know, I thought we, and my grandfather said, he was like, I kept doing this, I kept doing this, I kept doing this. And my great-grandfather was like, you forgot the part about this, OK? And I remember him. And, you know, and he was like, ah, oh, and I did forget the throwing, throwing the punch for it. So um, he was just, I, I, so Munkash, that's where that comes from. Another early memory I was in thinking about this talk was about books and reading. My two older sisters, at least what's told to me, is they, were, they read before they went to kindergarten. I didn't. <laughs> I think I, first grade, it, it clicked. But I have a really early memory of sitting with my mother, and for some reason I had learned the word the. It was the only word I knew. And sitting with her like on her lap with some big golden book or something open and going the, the, the. The, 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 and I thought about it, um, and remember feeling like I'm reading, and also I thought about later, you know, how dear that was for my mother, and what it must have been, you know, my mother might have been like, you know, I don't know, <laughs> but, um, so this idea of text and words and then there's this. <laughs> I was thinking about the early memories. And guess what? You can go online and find a picture of a rubber band very easily. Um, I, an early memory is have, playing with a rubber band and having a Bic pen and drawing on the rubber band and then going, oh, it transfers. Oh, it transfers. Oh. And being completely delighted by that, right? So then figuring out about rubber stamps. These aren't my rubber stamps. but. Like I've thought about it, I didn't think about it at the time, but I'm like, oh, this transferring thing. And then, by the time I get to high school, I was lucky enough to have a printmaking program in our high school, um, so the press. And, um, you know, that's been part of my life, you know, just anyone that, um, I don't have to go on about this. Um, and this is a print made by my sculptor colleague who claimed to never make a print. He's like, I'm not into making prints. I don't make prints, blah, blah, blah. And one day he stood up. He had been working with plaster. And he stood up from his desk chair. And I was like, Bruce, <laughs> you made a great print. Yeah. Um, so I liked that. I was like, move out of the way. I got to take a picture of this. Um, I talk to my students all the time about, you know, right, let's go. I mean, it was positive and negative. Like, making that print, those are 20,000 years old. And, some as early as 30,000, putting your hand, painting around it, a silk screen, basically. Um, I went to Syracuse University, as you said, then I graduated and I was in New York for a couple of years and I met Joe Wilfer and many of you. He's a Wisconsin son. Uh, this is a portrait of him by Alice Neal, made here when Alice Neal, I guess, was a visiting artist. Um, and I met Joe and he taught me how to make paper and I was taking classes at night and working, you know, whatever, a bunch of different jobs during the day. And he said to me, you have to go to the University of Wisconsin and learn how to set type and make books. And so I did that. So thank you to Joe for that. Um, one of the very, and Lynn talked about this collaboration. Um, I'm drawn to the book arts for so many different reasons that I'm sure I share with so many other artists. Um, the idea of a handheld art object, the idea of having sequence, you know, um, being able to control kind of the image through time. Um, and a big part of what I've always enjoyed about it is the collaborative possibilities. Um, this is the very, I don't know if it's the very first book, close to the very first book I did with Mario Laplante, who is, I don't know how many years you added up about, I was like, ah, 30 years or whatever it is, but we have had an ongoing, you know, without stop collaboration for that many years, working on drawings and prints and books. And this was the very first thing we worked together, worked on together. It's called Lists. And um, the paper, actually, when I was here, the paper mill was closed for a year or something was going on. And that's Walter Hamity paper, because he traded me 
for that paper because I couldn't get in and make my own paper. And I remember what I had to do was, in exchange, was cut out. It's so different because it's pre, you know, it's analog time, which was like hours and hours of cutting out like his collage material. Anyway, in exchange for, um, for this paper. So just a, the other thing about this was designing a binding. Mario did the lithographs. It was still very role separated. Mario did the lithographs. The manuscript was a friend of mine who is an artist living in New York, Heath Duquette. Um, and I did the design, the design of the binding and all the letterpress printing. Um, and I made these little envelopes, Japanese paper, and you can see that the illustrations would slip into the envelopes. And Tracy Hahn, um, this was the first project we worked on. And Kathy Keene gave us this manuscript. And it was, I mean, early on, not that work now isn't about production, but that foundation of, remember Tracy, we were figuring out how much paper we needed and doing all the math. And we're like, OK, and we had two or three months to work on it. And we're going to need this amount of paper, this amount of rag. We thought that would take the whole three months. And um, we wound up having a party instead and having scissors and rag. And in one day, all the rag got cut that we needed to make this paper. The book is uh, an edition of 160, which we've never done again. <laughs> you know, It was also that kind of production work. And um, this was a beautiful manuscript. Um, Joe Napora is the poet. He lives in Ohio. The book, The Journal of Elizabeth Jennings Wilson, 1853 to 1867. And this was based on um, the journal of his, his wife's great, great, great grandmother, some, I, I don't know how many greats, um, a pioneer woman in the Ohio Valley. And uh, just to give you a sense of the book, that in, it opens up with Joe explaining his method of doing that poetry with the primary text. And just as an example, and is that readable? Can I read? Um, one of my favorites, Ma, saying that she hoped I wouldn't throw myself away like a young lady not far off who she thought had gone down, a step down the scale instead of up as every young lady should aim to do. Up, I mean, not down. The ornaments were from the Silver Ruffle Press that we used in this book. And the, the love, I just, I took this close-up shot just because I remember being, you know, enamored of that punch in handmade paper, what the type looked like, and also Joe's, I mean, Tracy, we should talk about this, but, you know, I've always been struck by, you know, the AIs there, the hail and the quail, and just the aesthetic, the beauty of that. Um, collaboration, this is, what I'm doing here is I'm showing, so I, I would say there are four people I've worked with quite a bit, Tracy Hahn, Mario LaPlante, Patty Scobie, and Kathy Keene, all alum from here. So this is the beginning of a project, and there's Walter Tisdale over there. He came for support and wound up doing a lot of work. Um, this is in um, Plattsburgh, and where uh, I was teaching them lithography for us to make this book um, called Pool Sonnets. The poet, Dan Giancola, um, supported himself cleaning wealthy people's pools out in the Hamptons on Long Island. And this was a cycle of poems um, about that. And the illustrations are um, lithographic. And this is an example of when this has happened, and those of you that do production work you know, will recognize this, just more shots of the book. Um, we did everything. That was a lot of work. We did everything except the binding. And some, it got put in a drawer. And then Kathy moved. And then. I don't know, someone else moved. And then what happened to that box? Of so I think, yes, what happened most recently was it wound up with Walter Tisdale. Kathy Keene was visiting there. I'm talking about years and years and years later. And she called me up. She was like, guess what Walter has? Our finished but not bound. Oh, and he had bound it, but forgot the part about calling us and saying, like, we finished the project. So we wanted to then, I did this, designed this um, prospectus for it. OK, so to give, because the other thing was the title page said 1993, but it was being released in 2013. <laughs> so the truth was this, and found, of course, that Yogi Berra quote, gets late early out there. 
So this is how we release that. And um, that has definitely happened to me before. I'm kind of loath to put the, put the date on the title page. If you're printing that earlier, you know, I'm like, now I know. Hmm, not sure. Maybe print the title page last. Things take a while. Patty Scobie um, and I were, we were at McDowell Colony together. We also went to the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. And I just wanted to show this group of work. There, we made, they're not all here, but maybe 20 or 25 of these folios um, in response to, it was a whole series of work, this is just an excerpt, that we were doing about translating poets' work um, and what, what was involved with that. And one of the poets that we worked with during that residency was the work of Lee Young Lee. Um, and this is an excerpt from the poem we were working with. Um, the poem is called Always a Rose. For him arose my lover of roses and of God, who taught me to love the rose and fed me roses, under whose windows I planted roses, for whose tables I harvested roses, who put his hand on my crown and purified me in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, who said, get out, you're no longer my son, who never said, forgive me, why do I die? Hold me, hold me. My father, the godly, he was the chosen, my father almighty, full of good fear, my father exhausted, my beloved, my father among the roses and thorns, my father rose, my father thorn. And these are some of the responses or our translations of that text. It's a lengthy, lengthy poem. These are small little folios. Um, we limited our palette, obviously, to red, black, and white. A bunch of them together. Um, in, this is a book called Beautiful Little Bird, very limited edition, and it was the first piece of, wor of work I made after my sister, Beth Fine Kaplan, died of breast cancer. So, and there, there's an, in, uh, I'll show you, you know, it's hard to show books, um, you know, I'm trying to figure out the different pages, so bear with me. Um, you open the book and you see this image. The book is tall and thin. I was going to say no, but then I'm like, I'll just go like this. It's like this. I wound up deciding to do the book. Um, just using two different, the text is two different phone conversations I had with my sister. Um, this first one reads, in March of 1994, a few months before her 38th birthday, Beth called to tell me she had just been diagnosed with breast cancer. The fear of losing her filled me completely and immediately. I couldn't imagine living without her. I was crying when we hung up. Moments later, she called back. She wanted to comfort me. What are you afraid of? She asked me that question over and over again. What else are you afraid of? What else? As I answered her, she addressed my fears one by one. I'm the youngest of the three. She was the oldest sister. I didn't think I would get emotional, but apparently I am. The center spread is we, towards the end of Beth's life, we kept vigil with her in those last few days. And the reason it's called Beautiful Little Bird is um, my grandmother called all of us, all 11 grandchildren, in Yiddish, uh, Shane Fagenu, which means Beautiful Little Bird. And, you know, we never knew if it was like she couldn't remember who was who. There was a little bit of that. It was a catch off. She was like, oh, Shane Fagenu, here, come here, Shane Fagenu. So, um, Shane Fagenu, that's why it's called Beautiful Little Bird. And,. Um, then the, in the early part of the book, the bird is flying into the frame. There's this white on what, you know, it's, you can hopefully see the bird. I can hear your song is the text. And the second conversation we had four years later, on May 7th, 1998, Janet called to tell me Beth needed us to donate platelets because she was rejecting the ones from the blood bank. Because we're sisters, she would be more likely to accept them from us. The next day, I called Beth in the hospital to tell her I'd made the necessary arrangements with the Red Cross. She said, Deanie, I have something to tell you. I'm dying, and it's going to be soon. I know, I said. I love you. Five days later, 
In a deep sleep, her breathing changed. Her eyes opened slowly. We gently chorused our goodbyes and she died. So, um, sorry. <laughs> Not long after she died, Mario and I, we had been doing all this traveling together, and he had by then moved to Northern California. And we went up way north, like um, right just below the Oregon border on the coast of California. It was very remote. We were able to just pitch our tent on the beach, and no one was around, and it was you know, misty and wet. I remember one night we got the idea, like, what do we need to sleep in the tent for? Like, we just sleep out on the beach and woke up, like, soaking wet, you know? Like, oh, that's why it's good to be in the tent. We knew that we were going to go to the to this place. We actually had been there the year before. And, again, the, the loss of my sister was so recent. It was part of the grieving process. And we just brought with us things like um, spices. Um, you'll see, like, here turmeric and dill and things we knew would not, you know, cause any uh, concern um, environmentally. And every day we would get up, let's say we were there for a week just camping, and we would, you know, spend time making these little sculptures and then take a big long walk and come back. The tide had come in, so the, the pieces would be gone. And out of that experience, we made this book called Sojourn, which is um, a very important piece to me. Um, so I'm going to take you through it. It has a slip case. And we dedicate it to Beth. I don't know if you can read that, but I'm reading anyway. I don't know why I'm asking. Oh, God, everything which is above, per permit my hand to touch it. So our, that's an Ashanti prayer. Um, these are photopolymer plates. And it's so different from now. Um, again, this is analog time. We took, we had our film cameras. We took pictures. We scanned the film. Is that what we did? No, 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 no. We printed the film, wet process. Then we made, I don't even remember, so many generations of something that we do much more quickly now and um, from this step to that step very quickly. Um, so, but these are etchings, photo etchings. The image on the right is um, from a gravestone. You know, like there were a lot of grave sites, grave, uh, we, cemeteries around there, like nautical losses. The microphone? Oh, thank you. We have everything here. <laughs> so high tech. Praise the mixture of salt and water. Praise salt. Praise water. Um, this, for lack of a better way of thinking about it, this became a prayer book of sorts for us, a hymnal. What is veiled, what revealed. These pages, by the way, are just printed off the back of old etching pa page, you know, plates. It really was remote. Remarkably remote, come by here. The work of your hands is immeasurable. Behold, you are found. Sorry, I'm having trouble reading it. The harvest is bountiful, the gardener is nameless. In my house are many hopes on holy ground, I am restored. Mario and I wrote the text together. Another gravestone and basically the one other person we met when we were there, and that's a, a story for another time. 
Listen, it is a day to rejoice. Unconsoled, the, oops, sorry. Unconsoled, the music of the, can anyone see that better than me? The music of the wind and tide lulls us to sleep. Consoled, the music invites us to wake. That's a fold out in the book. And of Calfon explains our process. Um, that book led to, I was asked to have a show at Whitman College out in Washington State. And the show was of my prints in this big room, but there were these installation spaces. And Mario and I used one of them to do this piece called Beach Combing. Um, and you can see here, that's a, the, the explanation of what the installation was. Beachcombing is part of our ongoing body of work about the ocean, its vastness, its rhythm, its poetry. Part of this installation consists of handmade souvenirs, cloth-bound folios that house two hand-printed photo etchings of the surf images we captured on a trip to the northern California coast. You are invited to take a souvenir in exchange for your contribution to beachcombing. And so on. And so we made I don't know, a hundred or more of these little folios. And then folks, uh, what you just saw here was we set up a writing table and a drawing table for people to, oh, and this is what the souvenir looked like. They're all different, different shots of the ocean inside. Right there you see installation and people over the, the, for the time it was up, the walls just kept filling with different contributions which I have. They have the souvenirs and I have these images. Here's a few of them. I love this one. I happen to know this was made by Keiko O'Hara, who was a professor there. It wasn't, it was supposed to be anonymous. Some others. Um, I was invited, Mario and I were invited to go to Japan. Um, a stu former student and good friend of mine, Japanese, lived there and she and her family invited us. And quite a bit of work came out of that trip. Uh, on the last day, we didn't spend that much time in Tokyo, but on the last day, in Tokyo, we went to this big temple. This is what one that fortune book comes out of this. So we go into this temple, and we'd been visiting so many different beautiful temples all over the country. And we hadn't had our fortune told in any of them. And every single temple had different ways that you could do that. This, in this place, here I'll show you Mario. Those cylinders have a whole bunch of sticks in them. I don't know if some of you have been and had your, you know, done your fortune in one of these temples. Um, and there's a little hole on top, so you shake, 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 and only one of the straws will come out. And that has a Chinese character on it. Um, and then, like, you're just seeing a few of those drawers, but there are hundreds of those drawers. And you match the character to the drawer. And here's Mario shaking. <laughs> um, and then this is, like, you'd have to find, you can see the character there. <coughs> so because we don't, we didn't, know the Chinese characters, it would take us forever. So each time, so Mario did it first, and then just a passerby, people weren't, you know, didn't speak English, it would be like, mime, could you show me which drawer I should get my, went over and Mario took his out, and it was, you know, whatever, an okay fortune. And let me see, so in these, so there's hundreds of these drawers, and then stacks of these fortunes in each drawer. And you can see, I found some of these online. So you can get a bad fortune. It's not like, it's not like Disney World or anything. You know, look at that down below. Your wishes will not come true. The patient won't get well soon. The lost thing can't be found. The person you are waiting for won't come. You know, and so on. Mario did not get bad. Um, there are many different. I found a few of these choices. Here's one that's a better fortune. Your wishes will be realized in the end, you know, right? Um, so Mario did his, you know, whatever. And then 
Oh, and I saw, oh, and here's one, final, the least fortune, right? These are others, these I found online. But when I did mine, I asked, you know, then it was my turn, and um, a passerby, I'm like, can you, uh, so she brings me over, and we take out my fortune, and she starts, ah, like, this is so great, blah, blah, blah. and all these people come over. Apparently, I'd gotten a very, very rare, the absolutely best fortune you could possibly get. Okay, and it's like everything, and and I was so like Mario was just standing back taking pictures, and everyone's like clapping me on the back, and you know, and I'm like, this is great, you know, um, blah blah blah. So from that, oh, and it was funny too because when you leave the temple, if you've got there's a place where you can pay money to get rid of your fortune, like toss it into the, you know, so you know, you can you know, clear clear things out, cleanse it. So we were walking out, and I got, had mine. I'm like, mine's good, you know. And Mario, I think, was trying to decide, you know. He was kind of like standing there like, I don't know. How good is this? So someone came over and looked at his. Again, didn't speak English and was like, oh, no, you keep that. You keep that. You know, like it's okay. And then he gestures to see mine. And he's like, blah, blah, blah. And like all people come over again, like a whole different batch of people. And, and I'm like, no, I'm not. He's like telling me don't. Burn it. I'm like, I'm not burning it. I'm not burning it. But anyway, so I made this book um, called The Best Fortune. It's a little tiny square. It's, it's like a little, it's a little um, panel book. And it's excerpts from my fortune. You will meet good luck by chance, just like getting a gem from the rocks while you are digging. The patient will get well. The lost article will be found. These are photo etchings from photographs taken in Japan. The person you are waiting for will come. Your wishes will be realized. While in Japan, Mario and I visited, um, we visited cemeteries wherever we go. And this was in Kyoto and because Bodies aren't buried, it's, it's crim cremains, is that what you say? So um, built up on the side of a hill and very dense, like it, to me it feels like an urban cemetery, you know, because everything's so close together. And we noticed, it was really beautiful to watch rituals. I hope you can see like these, I'm pointing over here, but like these, these little like um, indentations and what we saw down at the bottom, before you climb up to, the, to go to your loved one's grave sites, um, at the bottom there's like a fountain and bamboo um, ladles and little buckets. And someone would take some water in their bucket with the ladle and climb up. And then they would dip water into that little dish, which I assumed, you know, just watching, um, that it was similar like in a Jew the Jewish tradition of putting a stone on a grave when you visited. We walked back and forth taking photographs, and this book um, called Offering came from what we did was, you know, so you could see, now obviously I don't know how rain plays into this, it wasn't a rainy season, but you know, some were dry, some were filled with water, so someone had recently been there, um, and it was cherry blossom season, different things blew, there were remnants in these, in these little offering dishes, I guess would be a way of talking about it. Um, I'll take you through this book. This book is about this size, and the, the images are digital, so our photographs printed out onto Japanese paper and then wrapped around the panels, and the text is letterpress. And when it was night, I thought it was day, an African-American spiritual. The text, it says in the Kalafan, is um, from the Heart Sutra, the Buddhist Heart Sutra, excerpts from it. There is no birth and no secession. There is no impurity and no purity. There is no decrease and no increase, no ignorance, no end of ignorance. No old age and death, no end of old age and death. 
no suffering, no origin of suffering, no cessation of suffering. No attainment, no non-attainment. Also, Buddha said, all things vanish in splendor, all things in themselves are evanescent. And the Kalapan page. And the last book I'm going to show you um, is the book um, most recently I did with Kathy Keene called Detours. <laughs> um, it says 2013. It really came out in 2016. Um, that same old title page issue. Um, and let's see, I think I put, it's called Detours. And oh, this is the colophon. I put it first here. We followed several list writing sessions with meditative activity of sewing our selected text. So Kathy and I decided, and some of you that know Kathy Keene's work, she does a lot of needlework, um, embroidering text. And she taught me how to sew, how to embroider. Um, well, she taught me so many things. She taught me letterpress, how to embroider. Thank you, Kathy. And um, so we wrote this text together over time. And then we decided, you know, we went our separate ways. And we decided, we found, we went shopping for old clothes and, you know, to the St. Vinnie's and Salvation Army and stuff and found things that we wanted to sew on. Um, and then we each, I'm not sure why we did this, but we each, so I don't remember, let's say we had a dozen things we were going to embroider, text that we wrote. Um, we each did it twice. So when we got together to put the book together, we had four choices for each page. Um, and in fact, some, I don't know if, you, if I said this to you, Lynn, but some of each book, like some are used in some and some in others. Do you know what I mean? So anyway, variable, variable right. Um, and some got completely, very few, but some got like, eh, this one's just not good, you know. Um, so we did that. We thought the whole book was going to be that. And then once we pulled that together, uh, we realized that it, we needed more text, this, these intro texts. Um, we begin with this quote from Alice in Wonderland. Alice came to a fork in the road. Which road do I take, she asked. Where do you want to go, responded the Cheshire Cat. I don't know, Alice answered. Then said the cat, it doesn't matter. Navigating the terrain. You can read it okay, right? Conventional wisdom. Fine tuning. Easier with practice. <laughs> kind of timely now. <laughs> At the ready. It all adds up. Favored by fortune. On the other hand, Turn it around. Ideal conditions. If only, baby. Plain and simple. Auspicious apologies.
And the final quote, and forgive my French. Qu'as tu fait, qu'as tu fait de la vie? Voices call in various languages gathered in your wanderings through two continents. What did you do with your life? What did you do? And that's Cisla Milos. I'm just going to end with, um, for years and years and years, I made, years and years and years, I can tell you how many years, 25 years, I made um, a broadside at New Year's that I would send out. Um, this is an excerpt, one that I did one of those years. I think it was the 10th year. I don't know why I remember that. Um, and it's an excerpt from Allen Ginsberg's footnote to Howell. That's a little folded piece. This is the front, holy. Holy, 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 holy. Holy, 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 holy. Holy the supernatural, extra brilliant, intelligent kindness of the soul. Thank you. How'd I do? How'd I want?